night. We will praise you, Lord God, forever, Lord. Hallelujah. Because you're worthy. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. For He is good, He is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise. Sing praise. With a mighty hand and outstretched arm. Father, we thank you. You are so faithful. 
You are a God that we draw our strength from, a God whose love endures forever. Oh, how you love us, Father. We thank you for that love. Your praise will ever be on our lips. Your love is devoted like a ring of solid gold, like a vow that is tested, like a covenant of old. Your love is enduring through Beyond the horizon, it's merciful today. Faithful you have been, and faithful you will be. And you pledge yourself to me, and that's why I sing your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will. Ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my Father, the orphan, your kindness makes us whole. You showed up our weakness, and your strength becomes our own. You're making me like you, clothing me in white, bringing beauty for ashes. Well, you will have your breath. She will be free. will 
be praised with angels. be seated. Open your Bibles once you get seated to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we've been talking about the spirit of faith and operating and how to have our faith be operated. Notice our main text in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 13, then we'll go over to Romans chapter 1, and we're finding out that the just are to live by faith. Of course, you and I are the just. He's making reference to the people of God, and so God wants us to live by faith. And I think a lot of people in their Christian circles uh, and their, their, Christian, their Christianity, they're wondering, you know, I'm not sure what God wants me to do. Well, He wants you to live by faith. Everybody say, God wants me. Come on, everybody say, it. God wants me to live by faith. And of course, to live by faith means you've got to live by the Word because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So the more Word I know, the more Word I have coming to me, hearing that I hear it, then the more I can walk by faith. And he wants us to walk our whole lives and everything by faith. But notice in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13, the Holy Ghost through Paul is writing and he's talking to the church at Corinth about the spirit of faith or the essence of faith or exactly how does faith operate because it's one thing to have faith. It's another thing for faith to be operating. Remember James chapter 2 tells us that you can have faith, but it can be dead faith. And dead faith means what? It's not producing. It's not productive. It's not doing what it's meant to do. And, of course, I, that's my problem. That's my fault if faith is not working because I'm the one that has to work faith that God has given to me that I've got from hearing the Word. But notice, once again, Paul said to the church at Corinth, and he begins to tell us about the spirit of faith or how faith works and how faith operates. And he said, we having the same spirit of faith. Everybody say, we have the same spirit of faith. Aren't you glad that it hasn't changed down through the years? We have in the same spirit of faith according as it is written. Notice now he's talking about there are two essences of faith and how to operate faith. Number one, he said, I believed and therefore have I spoken. Notice Paul said, I believe the word and once I believe it in my heart, then I have to speak it. Faith has to be spoken. There has to be some type of corresponding action from your believing. It's not just enough to believe it. Thank God you believe it, but you don't get the manifestation of it until you release it and you do that by speaking it out. Your faith has to be spoken. He said, I believed and therefore have I spoken. And he goes on and he's addressing them. He said, we also, everybody say we also. Now Paul's talking about himself and I'm glad the Holy Ghost told him to write, to write this down and say this. He said, we also believe and therefore speak. Notice once again, he said, I believe the word and so I speak it. But we also believe and therefore we speak it. I'm glad they put that last part in there because here's what people would have said. If Paul would have said, I believed it and therefore I speak, they would have come up with a doctrine and said, well, that's for Paul, but that might not work for you. No, we, it's for us also. Everybody say, it's for us also. And so God wants us to know how to operate in faith, hear the Word, have the Word come to you, receive it. Faith comes and gets in your heart by hearing the Word. When it does, now you've got to speak it out. It's important that you speak the Word of God out. We know this as far as salvation. Go back to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10 tells us that people can't get saved unless they hear somebody speak the Word of God. 
The spoken word is very powerful. We have to believe it in our hearts and then speak it out of our mouth. Everybody say, believe it in my heart and then speak it out of my mouth. And of course, God is watching over His Word to perform it and bring it to pass. Notice Romans, the first chapter, Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and verse 17. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16 and verse 17. He tells us the Holy Ghost through Paul said to the church at Rome and to you and I and to every believer, he said, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. How many of you are not ashamed of this message? Raise your hand if you're not ashamed of it. Boy, these are times where we need to not be ashamed. We need to be bold about it. He said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto what church? Salvation. To everyone that what church? Believeth is believing important. You know, a lot of people have heard the message, have heard the altar calls, have heard the plan of salvation, but they didn't believe it. They didn't want to get here to it. They didn't want to yield to it. They didn't receive it. And what happened? Well, then salvation didn't come to them. It was made available, but once again, your will is involved. I think sometimes we act like, well, you know, God's in control of everything. Well, listen, if He was in control of everything, He'd make people get saved. He would make people read the Bible. He would make people pray. But He's not that kind of a God. He's not a dictator. Come on, church. He's a loving, compassionate God. We serve Him and we do these things out of our own free will because we love Him. We found out He first loved us. But He said, For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. So believing is important. Faith is important. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. Verse 17. For therein, it's a continuation, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed. Everybody say, righteousness of God Come on, everybody say, the righteousness of God is revealed. And notice how, from faith to faith. Everybody say, from faith to faith. In other words, the more you study the Word, the more God reveals to you. The more God reveals to you, the more He begins to show you what His Word means and how He wants you to live. Righteousness means right standing with God. more revelation you've got from the Spirit of God, He reveals His will to you. When He reveals His will to you, then it's how He wants you and I to live. We're a process. Everybody say, we're a process. The day we got saved, we're saved. But then there's a growing process. The, I mean, the way we're at today, because of the revelation we have now today, is way more than the day that we got saved. The day we got saved, we all knew one thing. We just needed Jesus. We wanted to get some fire insurance. Thank God for fire insurance. But how many of you want to grow and find out the way God wants you to live, the way God wants you to talk, the way God wants you to think? Come on, church. The what He wants you to look at and see and hear. He tells us all those things, and He calls it righteousness or right standing. In other words, what He approves of and what He doesn't approve of. That takes time. That takes time for commitment for you and I. It takes discipline and study. And so, but notice it says from faith to faith. Everybody say from faith to faith. So wherever your faith is at right now in God, wherever it is at, just know this, you haven't peaked out. There's more. Everybody say, there's more. I hate to use numbers and money terms, but it seems like people can, they're so relative to that. If your faith is at a $25 level, you need to know this, God wants you to go to 50. And when you get to 50, He wants you to go to 100. And when you get to 100, He wants you to go on. Why? Our faith needs to grow. Everybody say, our faith needs to grow. And of course, you understand, the more you act on the Word, stepping out on the Word, putting your flesh in its place, putting your flesh under, putting your mouth under, come on, church. You know, one of the greatest qualities you'll find out, if you're going to become a mature Christian, you're going to have to get your mouth under control. If you go back and read James chapter 3, it talks about the perfect man is the one that has his mouth controlled. Well, that's a full-time job, isn't it? Because it's very easy to say things, but you've got to put it under control. That's part of growing, and it takes faith to do that. And he says, as it is written, everybody say, as it is written. Aren't you glad it is written? The just shall live how, church? 
Come on, everybody say, the just shall live by faith. How does God want you to live? By your feelings? No, how does He want you to live? By faith. How, does He want you to live by your emotions? Does He want you to live by your past experiences? Does He want you to live by your common sense? See, a lot of us think, well, yeah, sure. No, listen. You have to be careful because James says, you're to lean not on your own understanding. His word is even greater than your, what we would call common sense. You know, common sense tells a 99-year-old man he's not going to have a child. But God said you will. Abraham and Sarah, how many of you remember that? Common sense doesn't tell you to step out of a boat and you're going to walk on the water. See, faith will challenge your common sense. Are you with me, church? Now, trust me, a lot of people don't even have common sense, and we certainly need to go beyond that. But how many of you understand this? Faith challenges the way we think. It's going to challenge the way we see things, the way we're going to act. It's going to challenge our emotions. Faith is going to challenge you about every area of your lives because now all of a sudden we want Him to be Lord of our lives, but not just one little segment. He wants to be Lord of everything. Everybody say, Lord of everything. And so notice, if you would please, go on back to Acts Acts chapter 20, Acts chapter 20, we've been talking about some facts and we found out in Revelation that it takes faith and believing in the blood of Jesus. Aren't you glad for the blood of Jesus? I know I sure am. There's no remission, there's no forgiveness without the shedding of blood. Of course, we know in the Old Testament, God had types and shadows of animals. These animals, they had to be certain animals, they couldn't have blemishes in them, they couldn't have spots or wrinkles in them. They had to be without. They couldn't be sick. They couldn't be diseased. They wouldn't be the leftovers. They were the cream of the crop. Are you with me? They're all types and shadows of Jesus. Because God didn't give us the second best. He gave us His one and only who was the very best. And so, see, Jesus came to fulfill the Old Testament types and shadows. Of course, He did a lot of other things, but just within that, but in the Old Testament, the animal's blood covered the sins. But they still had sin consciousness. Why? Because covering your sin and washing them away are two different things. In the New Testament, Jesus not only covered our sins, but He washed them away. We looked several weeks and we found out that you and I, our consciousness can be pure from having to pass sin life. Now, the enemy will remind you, he'll bring the thoughts up to you, he'll tell you all the past mistakes you've made, but God won't do that. Everybody say, God won't do that. The enemy will bring condemnation to you, he likes to bring your failures, but if you go to God and talk to him about it, he may say something to you like, I don't know what you're talking about. Why? Well, we know in the Old Testament, the Scripture, he talks about, talking about the future and what he was going to do with sin. He said he threw our sins into the sea of forgetfulness. God has forgotten them. When you asked him to forgive you, he has forgiven you and he has forgotten it. Now the enemy will remind you. How many of you have had the enemy remind you about your past mistakes? Sure. Listen, he's not going to tell you about your future because his future is not good and your future is bright. Hello, church. So he's going to bring the past. And he'll try to condemn you, try to make you feel like, you know, well, you're really not forgiven, but you are forgiven. Forgiveness is not based on your feelings or your emotions. It's based on the fact. God has already paid the price. Now go to Acts chapter 20, Acts chapter 20, and we look at, well, we've been looking at several things about the blood of Jesus because it takes faith. It takes faith to believe the blood of Jesus would totally wash away a life of sin a life of transgression, a life of iniquity. It takes faith to do that. How many of you have repented before after you were a Christian and you didn't feel like you were forgiven? Anybody ever been there before? Well, what happens? Your mind begins to play games on you. And if you're, if you're not careful, the enemy will begin to put his thoughts into your brain. He'll begin to tell you, oh, you're really not forgiven. You know, you need to pray a little longer. You need to read the Word a little longer. You're really, you're really not sorry. I mean, I've heard all of them. You're really not sorry about what. I mean, He'll lay the whole thing out to you. But listen, God didn't say that. He said, come to me, 
Repent, the word repent means to change direction. Repent, ask to forgive, and he'll forgive us. Just believe it. Everybody say, just believe it. You know, and it took, it took me years to try to figure that out because I was basing so much on God hearing me uh, based on my feelings. I thought, well, if he forgave me, then my feelings would go away, not realizing my feelings have nothing to do with the word. The enemy loves to mess with your mind, and if he can put thoughts in your mind, how many of you figured this out? A thought coming into your mind will trigger feelings. It'll trigger emotions. You watch a horror movie sometime. You watch that, you see that, that thought gets into your head, and the next thing you know, fear's there. And now things are making you jumpy. Why? Well, because of what you heard, what you're seeing, what's going on in your mind, and then it starts to go out into the feeling realm. And the enemy, that's why he loves to play mind games. If he can get you to think on his thoughts, then before long it'll start triggering your feelings. Right on the other hand, if you can get to thinking about God's Word, meditating on God's Word, pondering on God's Word, confessing God's Word, are you ready for this? If you'll do that and begin to speak that, then your flesh will get lined up with the Word. See, there's a battle. Paul talks about a war. There's a war going on for your life. Now that you're born again, now the enemy is going to do everything he can to make sure you don't grow. And all he has to do is have you say, no, I don't want to read my Bible. No, I don't want to go to church. No, I don't want to pray. And he'll keep you dwindled and he'll keep you dwarfed in your faith and your relationship with God. But listen, if you're determined to grow, how many of you are determined to grow? How many think we're coming to the end here? I'll tell you what, Jesus is coming back very, very soon. And I think it's so important that we're determined to grow. Listen, at the best, he may be able to slow you down at times, but he sure can't stop you. Because we got the greater one on the inside of us. You got the greater one on the inside of you. Everybody say, I got God on the inside of me. How I many of you got God on the inside of you? You have victory on the inside of you. Now go to Acts chapter 20, Acts chapter 20, and let's look. We found out that the church, the church was purchased by the blood of Jesus. Every born again believer had to go through the blood. Now I'm not talking about membership in a local church, I'm talking about the body of Christ. I'm talking about people who are truly born again. Sometimes we have people teaching and preaching that if you go to the church, well, you're part of the church. Well, in one sense, you are part of a physical body, but that doesn't make you a born-again Christian. You must be born again in order to get into the kingdom of God. Notice in Acts chapter 20, Acts chapter 20, and let's start in verse 22, because Paul actually is speaking to a bunch of leaders, church leaders, in the book of Ephesians, and he's giving them some warnings because he's telling them, I'm not going to be around very long. You're not going to see me again. So he has a word from God for them about what's going to come up. Let's start in verse 22, if you would, please. And he said, and now behold, I go bound in the Spirit. Now, the word bound here doesn't mean bondage-like. He's just simply meaning, I am determined, the Holy Ghost leading me. I'm going to go and I'm going to do it. See, you got to be determined. Everybody say you got to be determined. By the way, what we're going to read here, Paul had plenty of opportunity to take another route, to do something different. But see, when God tells you to do something, even if it looks like it's going to pay you something, you've got to obey God. You've got to do what he said to do. And he said, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem not knowing the things that shall befall me there. Now, if we just stop right there, it's almost implying Paul doesn't have a clue what he's going to face at Jerusalem. But he kind of gives us an insight that he does know some information, but he doesn't know everything. How many know the Holy Ghost will show you things to come? Jesus said that. He said the Holy Ghost will show you things to come. Paul knew there were some things coming up. He didn't know all the details. And he said, save or accept that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city. How many cities, church? Every city. In other words, everywhere he went, 
The Holy Ghost told him what to expect. What did he say? Saying that bonds and affliction abide me. In other words, persecution is coming. Everybody say persecution is coming. Because when he talked about bonds and afflictions, he's talking about persecution. In other words, every city that he is going to go to, the Holy Ghost witnessed to him. Everybody say witness to him. Notice it didn't say he had a dream, didn't say he had a vision. Are you with me? Didn't say it was one of the nine gifts of the Spirit. He said it just witnessed. He knew it in here that persecution is coming. Well, are you ready for this? 2 Timothy chapter 3 tells us that if you live godly for Christ, you're going to have persecution come to you. Nobody said amen. That's nothing we want to hear. But listen, I like what I heard a minister say years gone by. Uh, he said years gone by. He said, uh, he said, I was preaching some things and saying some things, and, and he said, all of a sudden, the local postal service quit delivering the mail to the church. And he said he found out because it was direct, had something to do with what he was preaching behind the pulpit, persecution. We don't like to think about it, but he, I liked how he turned it around. Because see, persecution is rough on your flesh. Are you with me? Doesn't make you feel good. But I like what he did. He said, I just took it kind of like as a badge of encouragement. Well, I must be doing something right because at least they're paying attention. I remember hearing another minister say that he was part of the, they were writing articles about him in the local newspaper. And he said, what most of they, what most of they said about me wasn't true and wasn't accurate. But see, he just didn't let it go there. He said, but they did spell my name right. So see, listen, if you look for the silver lining, you can focus in on that. And how many of you know, they must have been paying attention to write about you. Don't get offended about it. Go back and you'll find out the disciples, when they were persecuted, they came back excited. Now that kind of makes our heads spin a little bit. But listen, when you come to the place in your relationship that you're more excited about what God thinks about you over man thinks about you, you've crossed over into a bridge where man's not going to control you any longer. Are you with me? So he said, verse 23, Say that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, say that bonds and afflictions abide me. But notice verse 24, But none of these things, what church? Move me. In other words, I don't care. I'm still going to do what God told me to do. But I appreciate God giving me a heads up. I appreciate when God gives me a heads up. I'm an individual that I have, I found this scripture years gone by where Jesus talked over in the Gospels of John about the Holy Ghost showing you things to come. And I look back, and I wasn't even going to the ministry. I wasn't going to Bible school yet, but it just kind of stuck with me, that verse. And I just found myself down through the years. Holy Ghost, show me things to come. Show me things to come. Jesus, you said the Holy Ghost would show me, and he has done that. Now, he hasn't showed me everything, and he's not going to show you everything. If he shows you everything, then you're not going to have to walk by faith. Are you with me? You're going to have to walk by faith because that's how he wants us to live. But I like it when he shows me things. Anybody else with me? Kind of gives me a heads up. I don't know all the details, but I know it's coming. Glory to God. Now notice he said, Say the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying the bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself. See, he's not in this for himself. He's totally in love with the Lord. Whatever the Lord wants him to do, he's willing to do it, even to die for the gospel. How many of you are ready to die for the gospel? Jesus paid the price. How many know this? Listen carefully now. You and I are not going to die. I said, I'm not going to die. If you're a child of God, you're not going to die. Jesus said, look it up in the Gospels. He said, if you believe in me, you're not going to die. I say that every time some of you just kind of look at me like, Pastor, have you bumped your head right before you come out? No, I'm just quoting what Jesus said. See, my flesh may die, but I'm not going to die. When you become more aware that you are a spirit being, first of all, rather than a, a body, then when somebody says, you're not going to die. You're going, yeah, that's right. I'm not going to die. What am I going to do? My flesh may stop, and I'm just going to leave it. I'm just going to leave it. Look, I'm just going to leave it. 
Glory to God. Now, notice, say, I'm not going to die. Say it with me, I'm not going to die. Boy, if you want to get religious people mad, just start telling them that. See, they th they're thinking natural terms, and Jesus is talking about spiritual things because I'm a spirit being. You're a spirit being. That's what you are. You just happen to live in a body. Your body has limitations. It's getting older. Come on, church. But thank God, we have promises about them being renewed. My mind can be renewed. My strength can be renewed. Come on, church. My youth can be renewed. My mind, all these things can be renewed. My spirit man is being renewed. Hello, church. So God has wonderful benefits. Now, read on here. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with griping and complaining. No, that I might. Everybody at verse 24? Everybody got verse 24? Say, I got it. That I might finish my course, how, church? With joy. How does God want you to finish? With joy. Are you ready for this? How does God want you to do His will? With joy. He doesn't want you to just get there and go, well, you're done, and then have joy. He wants you to learn to have joy all the time. Joy is important. Joy is more important than happiness. Happiness is based on feelings and emotions and everything going right in the natural realm. The joy of the Lord is on the inside of you, and it keeps you smiling on the inside, and it shows up on the outside when the world is chaotic on the outside. Why? I'm not moved by what's going on out here. I'm moved by what's going on in here. See, you need joy. You need God's joy in you because we're in a crooked and perverse generation. That joy, that joy is your strength. Life's a whole lot easier when you can smile about it. How many of you found that out? But when the enemy tries to take that smile off of your face, he starts to deplete your strength. He'll start to defeat your, defeat your strength spiritually, and if you're not careful, before long it'll start filtering and it'll start taking away your physical strength, and before long now you don't want to go to church. Now you don't want to read. That's why a lot of people aren't going to church today. They're going to blame it on COVID. They're going to blame it on this. They're going to blame it on that. But listen, when you get your spirit man strong and full of joy, bless God, you're ready to go. You're ready to do the will of God. Why? you got strength on the inside. You have His ability to do that. You need His ability, His grace to do that. That's what joy will do for you. That's why Paul said, none of these things move me. He said, for I don't count my life dear to myself so that I might finish my course with fullness of joy, with, full, with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that you all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more. In other words, this is it, guys. You're not going to see me again. Wherefore, I take you to record this day. Now, he's talking to the leaders now. This is a leaders conference. That I am pure from the blood of all men. What is he saying? I don't have anybody's blood on my hand. Scripture in the Old Testament talks about those people that we don't witness to, and they die and go to hell. Their blood is going to be on our hands. Paul said, I preached all of them. Now, trust me, if you go back and you study Paul's ministry, I mean, he, at the same city, he would have revivals and he would have a riot. But he preached to whosoever. They, everyone has a right to hear about Jesus. If they don't like it and they don't receive it, that's their responsibility. I can't make them get saved. I can't make them accept Christ. But I do have a responsibility to make sure they hear the good news. Everybody say amen. Glory to God. And that's what Paul's talking about here now, about their blood. He goes on to tell us, he said, to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that you all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, you shall see my face no more. Verse 26, wherefore I take you to record this day, that I am pure from the blood of all men. Verse 27, for I have shunned, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. See, Paul was a full gospel preacher. Verse 28, 
Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves. Now, notice he's telling the leaders, take heed to yourself. In other words, you need to stay in the Word. You need to stay filled with the Word. You need to stay filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, listen, if the leader's got to do that, how many believe everybody's got to do that? He said, take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. Notice what he said, to feed the church of God. What's the responsibility of a pastor? To feed the church of God. How many of you remember when Peter denied Jesus three times? I remember that story. How many of you remember when Jesus showed up after the resurrection? He went straight to Peter. And Peter denied him three times. And Jesus asked him the same question three times. And he told him about loving me. Do you love me? Remember, he died, denied him three times, so now he's going to have to confess, you love me. And what did he tell him after that? He said, feed the sheep. Feed the sheep. We have to have the word going forth. What does the word do? Well, it gives people the opportunity to get set free. It gives people the opportunity to believe the word of God. So he said, feed the church of God, which he hath, talking about Jesus, which he hath purchased with his what church? With his own blood. Everybody say, thank you, Lord. I am purchased with Jesus' blood. How many of you are glad you're purchased with Jesus' blood? Now go to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. And let's look at verse 26. Acts 17 and verse 26, we find another area that all nations of men are made one by the blood of Jesus. I'll tell you what, the blood of Jesus unites people. One blood, one Lord, one Savior, one God, one Holy Spirit. This word brings people together. No wonder uh, for a long time in the early church, you had mainly the Jews come together. They were getting saved. And then God, through the Apostle Paul, Send them out to go out to the world to get the Greeks and the world to come in. Now, the Jews didn't like it. Jesus even told them that there was going to be people come from the West. Well, the West is not just us, but we are part, if you look on the map, we're part of the Western culture. In other words, he was telling them that there's a lot of people coming from the East also, but from the West. Why? He said, because you're going to deny me. And even to this day, you'll find that Israel's still looking for the Messiah. Now, we're looking for him. The next time we meet him, we're going to be up there. Hallelujah. We know he already came. Glory to God. Aren't you glad you have already got sealed? Now, notice in Acts chapter 17, Acts chapter 17, and let's look at verse 26, one blood. Everybody say one blood. Notice in verse 26, and hath made of one blood... All nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their inhabitation. So there's one blood, say it with me again, one blood that unites us all. And what is that blood? That blood is Jesus. It just crosses over every kind of division, every kind of uh, uh, circumstance that people look at. It goes right over gender, goes right over age, goes right over money, goes right over nationality, goes right over everything, and everybody that will get under that blood becomes one with him. we got a lot of brothers and sisters. I said, we got a lot of brothers and sisters. Some of them are here on earth. Some are in heaven. Notice sometimes if you go back to the book of Ephesians, and over in 1 Corinthians, you know, sometimes we act like, you know, like there's two heavens or two kingdoms. No, there's just one heaven, and there's just one kingdom, and there's just one family. Some of the families down here, some of the families up there. One day, we're all going to be united. But sometimes we act like, you know, there's like two different families. No, there's not. We're all one family. Everybody say, we're all one family. And how you know we had some loved ones that, you know, went home to be with the Lord, and we're going to see them again. Glory to God. Now, notice, go, if you would please, go to the next one. Go to Revelation chapter 12. 
Revelation chapter 12, very familiar scripture to many of us about the blood of Jesus. Oh, it's good to be washed in the blood. Washed in the blood. Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. Let's go, if you would please, to verse 11. Very familiar scripture to us. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 11. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 11. Revelation 12 and verse 11. If you have it, say, I got it. Notice Revelation chapter 12 and verse 12, verse 11. And they overcame him. Him who? Well, if you go back to verse 9, depending upon where it's at in your Bible, he's talking about the old serpent called the devil. And they overcame him, the devil. How to do that? By the blood of the Lamb. Everybody say, by the blood of the Lamb. Say it again. The blood of the Lamb. Come on, say this with me. The blood of the Lamb helps me to overcome the devil. Now, I know that doesn't mean a whole lot to a lot of people, but if you go back to, once again, the Old Testament types and shadows. We see types and shadows, what the blood did for the people of Israel. The death angel was coming through. What did he do? He told his servant to go and take the lamb, the blood of the lamb, on the sides and the top of the doorpost. What is that? That lamb was a type of Christ. What happened when the, the death angel came through? It could not come into that house to take the firstborn. That's a type and shadow. When the enemy comes, when he comes through, you and I, we just found out and we read about the blood of the Lamb. Everybody in the body of Christ is covered in the blood of the Lamb. Are you with me, church? He bought you with that blood. When the enemy comes looking at you, he sees the blood. Now, the last thing you need to do is to deny the blood or act like it's not there. You're covered in the blood. That's what washed your robe. You're covered in the blood. Everybody say, I'm covered in the blood. And listen, when the enemy comes and brings any of his cohort, brings death, brings sickness and disease, whatever he wants to try to bring to you, brings fear, they say, oh, thank you, Lord, for the blood of Jesus. I'm covered in the blood of Jesus. I'm protected in the blood of Jesus. No weapon formed against me will prosper. But you have to say that. I'm enforcing my rights. I'm using my faith and believing what the blood of Jesus has done for me. If you don't do that, the enemy will just beat you up and beat you up and beat you up. You have to get your mouth going and speak the word. So notice, they overcame him. Two parts now. They overcame him, the devil, by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. Everybody say, by the word of their testimony. I just shared with you about the word of your testimony. What am I doing? Got to get my mouth going. What's my testimony? Greatest testimony you can ever share is what the Word says. Speak the Word, say the Word, share the Word, confess the Word, declare the Word, plead the blood. Speak the blood, speak the Word. Come on, everybody say, speak the blood, speak the Word. What happens? You'll overcome Him. Because, see, He understands what the blood is. He understands the minute you got washed in that blood, you were separated. Now you became a brand new creature in Christ Jesus. Now you are an heir of God. You are a son and a daughter of God. Romans chapter 8 tells us that. You are a son and a daughter of God. Come on, church. And you're made after his image. First Peter says you have God's divine nature on the inside of you. You ought to be shouting right now. Uh, I just don't know, brother. I just don't feel it. Well, go back and read it. Find out what God imparted to you. He put his love in us. He put his faith in us. He put his anointing in us. He put his blood upon us. Come on, church. Brand new creature, washed away. We've now been placed back to that position before Adam ever sinned. Glory to God. What an awesome stance. Restoration, that's what the word redeem means, to buy back. He bought us back to before Adam sinned, when Adam was reigning and ruling on earth, when he had supernatural provision in the garden, when he had more than enough to eat. Hello, church. 
when he had extreme intelligence to look at an animal. See, today we look at a cow and we go, well, that's a cow. Well, that's not just a cow. That's a jersey. That's a horse. I mean, all these other names. But he looked at him for the first time, and he just knew it because of his intelligence God gave him. Now God told us, after we're born again, the epistles, he said, now you and I have the mind of Christ. You have the mind of Christ. Say it with me. I have the mind of Christ. Say it again. I have the mind of Christ. Some people, you know, thinking about different heart diseases and mind diseases and Alzheimer's and dementias, you can have your mind renewed. That's what the Word says, renewed. I had a doctor one time, probably about two or three months ago, talking about different ages, and, and he wasn't calling me old or anything, but he was just saying, well, you know, the natural process, the older you get, things begin to slow down even mentally. And I'm like, not for me, doc. I'm going to renew my mind. How am I going to do that? I'm going to hear the Word. The Word is anointed to renew my mind, to keep it fresh, to keep it strong. Come on, church, so that I can remember things. Man, God imparts all this wisdom and all this knowledge and all this understanding to you and I, and then when we get up to what the world calls our senior years, listen, that's the time you and I should be the most valuable because that's the time when we have the most information God has given us. He sure doesn't want us to just step out. we got to impart it and pass it on. Hello, church. It pays to serve God longevity. Now, one more verse of Scripture. Go to Romans, the fifth chapter. Overcome by the, word of the, by the blood of the Lamb and word of their testimony. One more Scripture. Go to Romans, the fifth chapter. Romans, chapter 5. Aren't you glad you have the mind of Christ? Everybody say it. I have. The mind of Christ. Glory to God. Isn't that good to know that? Romans, the fifth chapter, talking about the blood. Last verse of Scripture we're going to look at. Romans, the fifth chapter. These are facts about the blood of Jesus and what it will do for you and I. Notice in Romans chapter 5, and let's look at verse 9. Romans chapter 5 and verse 9. Well, actually, let's start in verse 1 because it's several times mentioned here about the word we'll find that justification and salvation come by the blood. Justification and salvation come by His blood. Now, the word justification means declared innocent. Everybody say declared innocent. Come on, everybody say declared innocent. When the Bible says in the epistles about justification, that means God said you have been declared innocent. Now, the enemy will tell you different. But listen. Don't believe him because he's the father of lies. Whereas God cannot lie. Believe what God says over what your mind says. As a matter of fact, one way to find out where the information's coming from, if it comes up here, it's not from God. If it comes down here, it's from God. But see, God is a spirit and he talks to us down here. When you have a thought come up here, you probably better go start digging into the Word and find out if that lines up with the Word because the enemy loves to put thoughts and imaginations up here to bring down the Word to make it look like it's not true. But listen in here. Now, notice, everybody say, I've been declared innocent. Say it with me. I have been declared innocent by God. Now, notice Romans, the fifth chapter, verse 1. Are you there? He said, therefore, being justified or declared innocent, how, church? By faith. See, you've got to believe that by faith. Your feelings, your emotions, your mind may tell you, how is that possible? I mean, how can God look at me and just like that declare me to be innocent? Well, because of the blood. Everybody say, because of the blood. I mean, this is, it's not like, you know, God doesn't like a, a, a years gone by. Uh, many times I used to get grass stains on my blue jeans. Well, my mom, she of course, we didn't have the detergents and all the things we did as a young kid that they have today, but she'd scrub them, put them through the washer. Before she'd dry them or hang them out, she'd go back through and there'd be more grass stains. What do you have to do? Scrub a little more. Sometimes it would take two or three washings to get all the stains. The blood of Jesus is not like that. One time and you're done. Everybody say one time and you're done. You're not going to have to go back and ask him to forgive you again and again and again. Now, 
if you, if you do the same thing over and over again, absolutely. But I'm telling you, when you come to him and you ask him to forgive you, he forgives you right then and there. Wherefore, being justified by faith, so you've got to believe it by faith, and remember that the next time you ask the Lord to forgive you, and you know that he has forgiven you according to his word, but your feelings say, no, he hasn't. This is where you mix your faith and say, well, I believe what God says because God can't lie. My feelings lie. My feelings are subject to change. God said for me to repent. I've repented. God said to ask for forgiveness. I've asked for forgiveness. And I believe that he has forgiven me by faith. Everybody say by faith. Once again, you have to use your faith for this sometimes. Wherefore, being justified or declared innocent by faith, we have peace with God. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith. Everybody say it, by faith. How do we have access? Well, we have access to God by faith. A lot of people say this phrase, I'm just an old sinner. I'm not worthy. Well, listen, get saved and get worthy. Because Jesus made you worthy. Not because of what you did, but because of what he did. That's why he said, come boldly to the throne of grace. If you weren't worthy, he wouldn't tell you to come boldly. You would be very intimidated. We have the Old Testament where the priests would go in. They made sure that they were right with God. They made sure that they did all the ceremonies correctly and accurately because they knew when they got into the tent, and they got before the presence of God, that if they didn't do everything God told them to do, they would fall dead from the presence of God. They used to tie a rope around their ankle. They had bells on the bottom of the robe. Every time they moved, the bells moved. Well, they knew. If the bells stop ringing, something's wrong. They'd pull them out. Why? They didn't do everything God said do. They didn't judge themselves. They had sin in their life. How many of you know, we know in Romans it says the wages of sin are what? Their death. He said, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace or God's ability wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. How many of you are expecting the glory of God one day when you get up to heaven? How many of you are expecting that? Glory to God. He said, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. See, don't just glory looking when you get to heaven, but go ahead in the midst of tribulation and keep glorifying God. Oh, that, that's going to have to do that by faith, aren't you? And notice what he said. So I tell you the word of challenges. But we glory in tribulations, not tribulation, but tribulations. I talk about the tribulation period. He's talking about, man, when things just one thing goes wrong after another, we just keep giving glory to God. Everybody say, keep giving glory to God. Come on, everybody say, keep giving glory to God. Now, write this other scripture reference down, Romans chapter 4, verse 17 to 21. When Abraham finally got in faith, God told him he was going to have an heir. He was going to be the father of many nations. God told him that when he had no children didn't happen until 20 some years later one of the things that we find Abraham did when he finally got into faith was go back and read those five verses what happened or four verses you'll find out one of the things that kept Abraham in faith is it says that he kept giving glory to God kept thanking God kept praising God he he kept his he kept his attention he kept his mouth he kept his heart toward God. He kept praising God when it looked like it wasn't going to come to pass. Anybody can praise God after it came to pass, but what are you going to do before it comes to pass? You just can't praise God when everything goes right your way. If you do, you'll stay there way longer than what you should have. When God wants to deliver us, but he needs us to do what he says to do when things don't look favorable. And that takes faith because your feelings want to resist it. Your mind wants to resist it. Your emotions want to resist it. 
Your flesh wants to retaliate. You want to get mad. You want to get upset. Everybody say, don't do it. And so see, faith says do the word. Count it all joy. What? I don't want to count it as joy. It's not joy. You got to count it as all joy. Hallelujah. You got to be able to do that when it looks like everything is chaotic and going wrong. He said, rejoicing in hope and the glory of God, but not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulations worketh what church? Patience or endurance. My mother used to tell me as a little kid, patience is a virtue. You know what I thought of that quote? I didn't want to hear it. I thought, don't tell me about patience. I don't want to know patience. That's a lot of Christians today. We want everything instant. We think, I'm going to pray. Five seconds later, bam, it's going to happen. Well, it may happen. But listen, if it doesn't happen, that doesn't mean God said no. And that doesn't mean God said you can't have it. You just got to stay with God. I said, you got to stay with God. And he goes on to tell us, work with patience. See, we need a little patience. And patience experience and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Do you have the love of God in you tonight? Do you have the love of God in you tonight? Verse 6, for when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure, for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ, what did he do? He died for us. Notice, and if you remember, Jesus said, I didn't come to, he said, I, I came for those who were lost. I came for those that needed a physician. He didn't come for the ones that knew the physician. He said, I came for those that didn't have a physician. Verse 9, much more than be now justified. Everybody say, I'm justified right now. Say it again. I have been declared innocent by God when church. Come on, everybody say it right now. Come on, everybody say it. Being justified now by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. What does that mean, wrath? Well, there is coming a wrath. There is coming a judgment. There is coming the wrath of God when one day, when God's judgment is going to be poured out. Aren't you glad because of the blood of Jesus, we have been delivered from that wrath? Close your Bibles and stand up. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.